I'm Alex Mosed. Welcome to Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle between large tech monopolies and traditional incumbents. So today, first thing we're going to talk about is Lyft. Lyft reported their quarterly earnings and their stock is down. Why is their stock down? Because uh, their ability to get to a point of break even is lagging behind Uber. So ride hailing efficiency uh, and, and basically... How quickly do they stop losing money is lagging. Now, on the show for many, many months now, uh, I've been very bullish on Uber, especially compared to Lyft. And the reason why is because Uber is a platform conglomerate. And what you see, particularly in Plat, which has Lyft and Uber in it, but when platforms can become that winner take all that tech monopoly status is particularly identified by being a platform conglomerate which means you have not one but multiple platform businesses at scale at critical mass and that these platform businesses now they stack their network effects on top of each other which you can see with uber and uber eats and now uber freight and you can start to see all of these things compiling upon one another, which means that the platform is able to kind of recycle, solve for the chicken and egg problem, solve for demand, solve for supply more efficiently or more cost effectively at scale uh, than a platform that only has one specific platform business like Lyft. All this does is kind of confirm the theories and, and, and positions we've already taken on the show. I continue to see Uber as a great value stock. Uh, that's right, a value stock that will continue to to rise to uh, tech monopoly status. I think I don't even think it's back at where it IPO'd at um, right now. Next topic: Walmart, which is is, is going to announce earnings next week, actually, which has done a fantastic job of embracing marketplace. Of, um, of what I would think will go down as uh, one of the best business transformations in the past 50 years will be the number two dominant marketplace behind Amazon, which will be a great win for them. They're going to end this Jet Black service. This Jet Black service was started by uh, one of the ladies who co-founded, I think Jenny Fleiss. Uh, I think she co-founded uh, Rent the Runway, not a platform business. What was the challenge with Rent the Runway? It's not a platform. Uh, they buy a bunch of dresses. They rent out the dresses. All the inventory sits on their own balance sheet. And, um, you know, the, the product catalog is limited. The dresses get a lot of wear. And so consumers like the service, but I would say they don't love the service. And it has inventory problems. Um, and so this Jet Black service is is kind of bringing, a, I, I guess, you know, it's like a personal shopping service. I didn't realize it had 350 people in it. Um, and then she went to go run it and build this kind of like a personal concierge shopping service for, I guess, like more higher end customers. I wouldn't say anything terribly unique or novel about this. And uh, I mean, a bunch of retailers have these, you know, the Macy's and the Bergdorf. So all, all of them have some kind of personal shopping uh, service. So this is kind of like a linear. It's a value add service on top of Walmart. The interesting thing is this article says that Walmart was seeing if they could kind of get other investors that could kind of spin this business out. Uh, it seems like a Hail Mary effort. Um but probably the right thing to shut this down and uh, and just focus back on the core or focus on B2B distribution, for example. So, um, yeah, let's talk about um, social gaming. So in in the world of video games, a place very near and dear to my heart, um, I grew up playing EverQuest and then uh, Final Fantasy XI, their MMORPG, if anyone is familiar, that means massively multiplayer online rolling role playing game. Yes, thank you very much. Um, my character was amazing, and um, there was a lot. There are a lot of social networks that spring up around these games. If you kind of think about all these online games, which now all all of the biggest games have an online component to them. Um, you know, we're going to talk about more about Fortnite and Epic in a minute here, but they're inherently 
online and social. You're either um, having these micro communities like clans or guilds, which, you know, what Zuckerberg talks about is actually moving away from these large, um, very broad social networks and now to niche kind of micro communities as evidenced by like groups on WhatsApp and, and Facebook Messenger. And so Zuckerberg has spoken about this a lot, right? The kind of less willingness to just share with everyone and more willingness to share with hyper localized friend groups um, that are that are focused around, guess what? Topics of interest. So that you've seen Facebook promoting Facebook groups, for example, very, very heavily taking out a bunch of ads on that. This is the same kind of trend, but in the video game world. Activision and Blizzard have done, I'd say, a pretty good job of this. Um, helping to connect people that play other Activision Blizzard games, particularly Blizzard games. So if you play World of Warcraft or you play Starcraft, you can now meet and see what your friends are playing, what other games they're playing, go play games together, all these kinds of things. You have seen Apple and Google try to create what I would call social networks that span across a variety of video games, right? That aren't uh, manufacturer that aren't video game creator specific like activision and blizzard right so how can i have a social network that says you know whatever game you're playing i want to connect and see what my friends are doing or exchange interact with them or create new friends and then have those relationships carry on into other games that really hasn't been done no one has captured that opportunity you've seen apple uh try to create this thing called game center which is uh, was basically nuked in the past year or so uh, with, with the new operating system update, which was trying to do this and it was embedded into all the games. That's pretty much gone. That's pretty much DOA. Um, you've seen the Google Play. It's literally called like Google Play Games. Horrible name. Um, that it's kind of trying to do this on Android games. So you've kind of seen the... The development, the massive development platforms, the massive smartphone operating system platform companies try to do this. They really haven't done a very good job at it. Um, Google's tried and failed at social networks many times. I think Apple just has a lot of concern about privacy to really go and embrace social very well. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's dead. I think this opportunity is very much so alive. And I'm actually kind of surprised that video game creators, the large ones, and there's at least, I'd say, 10 or 15 multi-billion dollar video game creators that could actively seize on this opportunity. They have the size, they have the scale, they have the users. Um, that They could either launch it on their own or they could do a JV with one or two other large video game creators and help get enough critical mass to do this. I think Epic is actively looking at this. We've seen what they're doing with the Epic social network on Fortnite and trying to really have you create an Epic account. We've seen who owns Epic. Oh, this company called, oh, that's right. Tencent, uh, just a small, large tech monopoly that you may not have heard of in Platt. Tencent and Epic, they understand platforms very well. They launched this thing called the Epic's PC Game Store to go head to head with Steam. Steam has had a pretty much a stranglehold on PC game delivery. They have had the dominant marketplace to uh, to to buy and distribute video games, and then now you can, you know, purchase digital items on there and all these things on the PC for many many years. How did Epic get a wedge into that market? It's actually a great little case study. And one of the key things that they did is they locked up key supply, highly sought after supply. They went to some of the key video game creators, gave them exclusive royalties mm -hmm. to say, when it comes to the PC, you know, on, on Xbox or PlayStation, you can distribute it as you normally would. But when it comes to the PC, you're only going to distribute this video game through my Epic PC game store. And they, you know, you pay them an upfront fee. You, know, you make it worth their while because they might have some less sales if it's only going through the Epic store versus Epic and the Steam Valve store. Okay. Um, but you lock up key supply and then now you know that there's already an audience base that wants this game and now they have to come and get it from only me, the Epic PC game store. So, um, 
really good lesson in uh, um, just, you know, platform competition. We've seen this in the video game industry in many other places, like what Microsoft's Mixer did to Twitch, taking Ninja and other really highly sought after, highly recognizable video game players that have huge streaming audiences, uh, lock up that and, and bring that to uh, bring that content basically to to Microsoft's streaming platform. Um, we've seen this model used in a, in a number of other industries as well. We've also seen it with Xbox and PlayStation locking up key video game titles also for their consoles or just buying Bungie outright for Halo, right? So you've, you've seen this strategy many times before. It's a tried and true strategy. It certainly costs a lot more money, um, but you know you're gonna get demand for the supply that you're locking up, right? And that can help jumpstart your 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 demand side of the equation. So Epic has done this. Epic understands platforms. Tencent understands platforms. They have the balance sheet to make these kinds of investments. We are seeing a number of tech startups try to create social networks around video game communities. Um, we're seeing them use video. This company here, Metal TV, raised $9 million. They could have raised way more. They turned it down. There are a lot of these businesses out there that are trying to bring people together. Um, you look at Discord, right? Uh, um, helping really capturing that gaming community. I think Discord could be doing a lot of other things to build upon the community that they have today. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity when it comes to social and when it comes to the gaming community, forging new relationships, strengthening existing relationships. How are video game creators really helping to own a piece of that inevitable future? We will see. So um, we speak a lot about, right, how on the show, the show is all about how do tr traditional incumbents go up against large tech monopolies and what is going on with this? A key tenant of that is this thing called corporate innovation. So what is corporate innovation and how do you go about thinking about this? Pretty broad general term could mean a lot of different things. So the way I think about it is there's kind of two major buckets. There's corporate innovation, which is focused on incrementally improving the core business. You've got to be doing that. If you're a large traditional business and incumbent business, you need to be digitizing the core business. You're not necessarily making wholesale changes to your business model, but you are finding how to uh, make incremental wins to digitize the existing, to use data, big data, to use AI. How do I kind of help automate, help accelerate, help weave digital into my existing business model? Okay. Um, these are going to be, I'd say, less risky projects. These are going to be projects that are probably very large in scale, um, have, a, have, a, have a much larger price tag associated with them, a much larger time to implement, because what you're doing is, is making changes that are going to affect your core business, right? You don't want to be taking big bets on these things and you need to get them right. You need to make improvements on the core business to stay competitive. Um, and so this is definitely a key area of focus. The other bucket of corporate innovation is what you would call disruptive innovation. This is where you're really exploring new business models. So if you're kind of thinking of a time horizon, right, you might be thinking of a one to three year time horizon on incremental improvements. And on the new business model time horizon, you might be thinking on the three, five or farther out time horizon in terms of what are the new business models coming into my industry? What might cannibalize my existing business model? What might be accretive or complementary? How am I figuring out how to uh, to what what new business models are coming in and what I what I need to be doing as a result of that? Right. The the one overarching school of thought in terms of exploring disruptive innovation is how do you give a small team very little time and very little money? How can you go and learn a lot and, and try out and make small bets and get a lot of learnings, um, fail fast, right? All of these kinds of mental models that should be deployed, particularly when exploring disruptive innovation. When you look at the different options that you have to explore, there's, there's in the world of disruptive innovation, there's a, there's a closed avenue and there's an open avenue. And basically, there are closed initiatives that you could be doing, which are purely kind of inside of your organization. And then there are more open initiatives, 
where you are going to be looking externally. So what could you be doing disruptively that's closed and internal? What could you be doing that's open and external? There might be a hybrid overlap space in between there, uh, but there are generally these two buckets. So that's closed and internal. You could kind of think about um, internal incubators that you're setting up. How am I letting my teams you know, do the 80-20 rule, try out new skunk projects, try out new initiatives? How am I enabling my existing employees to innovate, to be creative, to incubate new ideas, fail fast, and, and all of those kinds of things. You could also think about this as an R&D lab, um, especially if you're in the world of patents, which, which could even be a much farther out timeline uh, than three or five years for, for patents. But what, what kind of new technologies am I incubating or investing in for the long term that if these technologies take off, I could build a new business model around this or it could be disruptive to my core business model, so on and so forth, right? These are initiatives that you are really leveraging your internal assets, making sure that you're tapping into the different pockets of, of innovative thinkers, and entrepreneurs, we just covered entrepreneurs uh, on, on yesterday's session and how you bringing this all together inside of the company, right? The more open external initiatives would be looking at things like accelerators. And there's a lot of corporate accelerators. There's a lot of firms that uh, will help uh, companies set up their own accelerators or kind of hybrid models where it's a you know a large company sponsoring an accelerator you could also just be tapping into or keeping your thumb on existing accelerators and what interesting companies are coming out of those accelerators and trying to keep keep on top of uh, what the different startup trends are typically some kind of like uh you know, head of innovation type of person would be overseeing this and liaising with the startup community and these different accelerator type programs. There are also startup networks that large companies can engage with where, you know, that startup network has a more curated ecosystem of startups that maybe they weren't all, you know, they weren't in an accelerator program. So they're, you're not restricted to what comes through that specific accelerator, but you're saying, hey, I'm just going to look at the whole world of startups. I have a network of these startups and we're going to help you kind of like speed date. We're going to help understand the needs of the corporate business and we're going to help go and set up all, you know, help curate to you all the different startups that could be interesting to you. This might be helpful if you're a head of innovation and maybe you don't have a large staff or it might be helpful if you don't have a head of innovation at all. Um, and you could kind of help externalize some of that work and, and they will help tee up a lot of meetings and understand your needs and help maybe see if there's some partnerships or prototypes or collaborations or investments uh, that could come out of that. Then there's the whole world of corporate venture capital, which you could actually have, uh, you know, what they call a CVC arm, where you'd have a head of corporate venture capital that you give some funds to, or maybe you do deals on a one-off basis, uh, where now you are doing some investments, you're maybe doing some partnerships uh, with startups and, and, and specifically saying we want to deploy capital into startups and having someone own that, really know the space and run all of that. You also have corporate venture studios. So venture studios we've covered on the show are um, helping to bring a strategy, resources and capital uh, around a new business opportunity, helping to incubate that, help the business get off the ground maybe some demand or supply or both. And then you let that startup go and raise other external capital and hopefully be wildly successful. And, uh, but now there are corporate venture studios that will specifically try to partner with either a head of innovation, a head of the CVC arm or something like that and say, hey, um, you know, are there some opportunities that we could help spin up and, and build from scratch uh, in cooperation with this large traditional enterprise. And so that's kind of the corporate venture studio world, which there are more and more of those propping up these days. Um, and then I would say lastly, would just be having a corporate development department, uh, you know, a head of strategy that's looking at M&A. You know, you could also be looking at one-off investments or partnerships in this, in this group. You could be looking at outright acquisitions, 
a hybrid or a mixture of all of those different things and looking at how does M&A help to accelerate these new opportunities. I think the key thing in all of this is trying to figure out what is important. Where do I start? Where do I need to invest? Where do I need to accelerate? Where do I need to solve some, some gaps? And I think that's the, the really difficult thing. And I go back to my point about giving a small team very little time and very little money because there are so many different options and so many different opportunities, right? Especially if you're a large multi-billion dollar company. The hard part is to say, I've got a hundred opportunities of here. How do I say 99 no's? How do I make the one right yes? And then I need to execute on that and capture that opportunity effectively. But you, but if you are spreading too many bets and spreading yourself too thin, you're never going to be able to execute effectively in the first place. So how do you get the right level of conviction to say, this is where we need to own. This is a key part of our future. This is a key new disruptive business model that is important. It's a part of our vision. It's a part of who we are. We need to own this versus should I just invest in this? Maybe this is an incremental improvement going back to, you know, what is disruptive versus an incremental innovation for the core business? How do you balance these two different sides? So you could be doing external uh, functions that I've spoken about here that are also helping to make incremental improvements in the core business. Do you need to buy that startup or just maybe do a, an investment or a partnership and your business can still get the benefit and, and get that incremental improvement? There's no silver bullet to all of this. There's a lot of different options to weigh. Um, but these are some of the different buckets and some of how I would break down kind of how, how you could kind of think about the world of corporate innovation. So another topic that we get asked about is what are corporate accelerators? Uh, so corporate accelerators are basically, you know, an accelerator is to say, I have, so if you think about Y Combinator as an example, so we have a number of people in the company who've gone through Y Combinator. You already have a business, you already have a team, you might have a product, or you might be just about to launch a product. Um, you might have some prototypes or something like that. Um, depends on the industry that you're in. Biotech is very different than just pure play tech startups, right? But the idea is that you're going to go through a program. Uh, typically, it's 12 weeks long or so. Some are a little bit longer or a little bit shorter. Usually, it's all in person. Um, usually, you are seated with some money. The accelerator gets some equity in exchange for that. You know, Y Combinator is giving you a small amount of money, they're getting like 7% in equity, but then they're also bringing you all these investors and they have investor day and they helped you raise capital. If you get into the program, that's a huge stamp of approval in and of itself, right? There are literally investors that will only invest in tech startups that go through Y Combinator. They won't invest in, in, in anything else. So some accelerators can be longer, can be three or six months long, um, rather than just 12 weeks, but you've kind of seen some of the most notable ones around the 12 week uh, um, model. So you're broken into cohorts after you get accepted into the program. You're all on site. Uh, you usually, you know, you're going to get investment, you're going to get mentorship, you're going to get education, and you're going to get intros to investors or other advisors and, and so on and so forth. Um, the corporate accelerators are then going to spin up programs that are specific and going after a specific type of companies uh, that would help a, a, a company's needs, like a Microsoft, for example, has done corporate accelerators, right? So now you're going to get existing startup teams in areas that are strategic significance to Microsoft. And now you're going to have those companies could, could get funding from Microsoft. They could get partnerships from Microsoft. You're going to have a lot of access to different executives and two different departments at Microsoft, but it's not mutually exclusive. You could go through the accelerator program and not get anything from Microsoft or not get any investment from Microsoft, but maybe uh, Microsoft's competitor is interested in you. So um, you're not you're not pigeonholing yourself just to say, well, I you know if I go through this and Microsoft doesn't like me, I'm in trouble and that's a stain on me. No, not necessarily. Um, but you are definitely going to have much greater access and involvement and uh, um, and insight into the needs of Microsoft, which which might steer your product roadmap 
or, or, or your business model in a certain direction if you know that you're trying to tailor something for Microsoft going into it, right? So, um, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to, uh, to going through a corporate sponsored accelerator as well. We've seen Nike do this when they were trying to get the fuel band going. They created an accelerator to try and get startups that are going to build software uh, using the data coming out of the fuel band. Ultimately, the fuel band failed and, 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 and they shuttered that. And so um, you've seen examples of this working and you've seen examples of this not working where the fuel band is much newer, a newer product than they're trying to, to jumpstart that supply side of the equation with startups building software on top of it. Okay. That's it for us today on Winner Take All. Thank you for joining us and I'll talk to you next week.